Hey everyone, Crisis here. This month marks the 35th anniversary since the original Metal Gear's release way back in 1987. With this series being one of my favorite franchises, as well as where my scaling videos really took off at first, I'm going to pay tribute to the saga which I love, going game by game in the chronology, breaking down every feat of power or statement from the fodder of the universe to the top tiers. I've made a handful of videos detailing the series' power scaling already, but never something as comprehensive as this. For the greater part of two years since my original set of videos, I've been researching Metal Gear, finding new sources, guidebooks, interviews, official novelizations, etc. All to the ends of building the most complete understanding of its power progression and combat abilities. This project is gargantuan, and years in the making. Therefore, these videos will be broken down into parts, more or less associated with a specific game or era of games. Perhaps down the line, all parts will be combined into a three hour long documentary, but to make things a little easier on my end, as well as provide you guys with some content as soon as possible, this is part one of many. As far as the canon of the series and what I will be taking into consideration, whenever a source worth explaining comes up, I will make the effort to justify its validity as far as power scaling is concerned. Generally, however, I will be of course looking at the games themselves and their continuity as it is in the year of 2022. Information from the official guidebooks relating to those games wherein it doesn't overtly contradict the bulk of sources, official novelizations approved by Konami or Kojima, again where they are not totally incompatible with more primary sources like the games themselves, interviews by irrelevant staff members from Kojima Productions, and so on. When it comes to things like novels or comic adaptations, I'll more or less be taking the approach that they are secondary canon. That means that they are official, but do deviate in some manner to the main canon media, the games in this case. But where they do add more context to the series that can logically sit beside the primary canon, I will consider it viable. To get this specifically out of the way though, most of the Metal Gear Solid games have novels in Japan. We know for a fact that Kojima outright co-edited slash co-wrote the bulk of these novels and had heavy collaboration with their writers. Project Ito was close friends with Kojima and had access to Metal Gear Solid 4 script when scribing that novel. Kenji Yano would send notes and outlines to Kojima for approval, they're pretty authentic interpretations of the MGS series, and have useful info for almost all of the games. Also, Metal Gear Solid 3 existence is a type of official machinima for the game, and is useful for determining exactly how fights depicted originally as gameplay went canonically. The movie version of MGS3 here was heavily overseen by Kojima, yada yada yada. Good to mention here as clips from that will be used throughout this portion. There is of course nuance regarding most information which again will be expressed as those sources become relevant. For now though, we begin our journey with a man named John. Starting off at the beginning of the timeline, we already have Naked Snake showcasing a very impressive feat, as he was exposed to radiation multiple times and was only rendered infertile, while others who were irradiated died soon after. Immediately, this has some pretty big ramifications. If you think Portable Ops is valid to use, I'll get to that eventually, don't freak out. This could be the real world explanation for why Big Boss or The Boss, who is also irradiated, are able to perform the feats that they do as it's shown within the game that radiation can give someone straight up superpowers, but it's not too relevant honestly, I'm just laying that out there for casuals who think there needs to be a reason for these fictional human beings to do things that no real human could ever do. Regardless, Big Boss pretty much resists radiation that would kill a normal person. From here, Jack is trained by and fights besides the boss for years, learning everything she knows where they would each develop and perfect close quarters combat. Now I've seen people argue, and I've even made the claim myself, that CQC is some kind of hard counter or kryptonite to other martial arts, but that is not supported by the fiction and pretty much makes zero sense on the face of it. In reality, CQC is a unique martial art form, with individuals in and out of universe stating it to be far ahead of the curve of the 1950s where the style originates. One of the Peace Walker soldier quotes states that a CQC throw hurts at least twice as much as a normal throw, 
or a throw via another martial art, implying it's at least two times more complex or effective of a hand-to-hand -hand style. Mato Satomori, the series' military expert on the MGS3 website, stated in an interview that one must master fighting with knives and guns before CQC even becomes effective at all with the MGS3 manual and portable ops stating that Snake is skilled in all types of military equipment and weaponry as well as being a master of CQC. Again, Snake is proficient off the bat in every manner of military equipment and all types of weapons. Kojima said in an interview for GameSpy in 2005 that CQC was composed of cutting-edge fighting methods, opting not to use martial arts from the game's time period as to not seem archaic in presentation. In Metal Gear Solid 3 The Countdown, Kojima as well asserts that the techniques aren't even known by military enthusiasts in the real world. This would mean that, since the form was devised in the 1950s, Naked Snake and the boss are using techniques at least 50 years more complex than what was being used in the actual 1950s. The MGS4 military guide even goes as far to say that CQC has a near infinite level of variation in its approach. Near infinite? So, it's not that CQC is some kind of rock to the scissors that are other martial arts, just that it's quantifiably so much more effective than other hand-to-hand -hand styles that its practitioners are far above the competition. So, already, this is a pretty beefy foundation to the versus skill scaling. With that, let's move on into the actual virtuous mission. Here, Snake learns from the boss that one's spirit is a greater factor in combat than even one's body or skills, which will become very relevant soon, I promise. As well as learning that Snake's honed his senses to his utmost, with the boss trusting him to watch for subtle movements, small shadows, sounds of the enemy amongst the symphony of the forest, and maybe smells like gunpowder and sweat, if you think Big Boss can smell it all. I can't smell. It smells like a rotting corpse to me. Fox's modus operandi is sneaking around without leaving a trace, meaning Snake isn't allowed to sweat or leave bullet casings or footprints on the ground canonically. Bonkers. Kojima stated that Snake's wearing of normal fatigues here compared to the other passengers' pressure suits is the first time where Snake showcases his superhuman nature. A little humorous, but still interesting that Kojima at all acknowledges how Snake here is already genuinely built different. Naked Snake is a little rusty going into this mission, having not used CQC during his time in the Green Berets. Nonetheless, he's able to fodderize the Ocelot unit, as well as read their body language to determine that they were young elites in the MGS3 novel. To put this into perspective, the fodder KGB soldiers in this game are trained to protect the Kremlin and high-level VIPs within Russia. The Ocelot unit is an even more elite group, with legendary level weapon skills, with the MGS graphic novel database even calling them the most elite fighting force, brandishing MGS3 artwork of the Ocelot unit. The Metal Gear Solid graphic novels were put on the Legacy Collection in Kojima's words to provide a way for fans to experience the stories of MGS1 and 2 if they aren't able to adapt to the game's archaic mechanics. He has well stated that the MGS2 graphic novel properly depicts what Snake was doing during the mission while the player controls Raiden. Some things are changed, obviously, like the final battle where Solidus negs Raiden and Solid Snake negs Solidus in return, clearly different than what happened in the game itself. However, I think the best way to look at this in a way as to cause no contradictions is Kojima essentially means that if certain things were to happen differently, the comic would be an accurate depiction of said events. So while Raiden did beat Solidus, we're told that it is valid that if he lost here, Solid would be able to beat Solidus pretty easily in Raiden's place. So this, combined with the use of art from the saga to represent these data entries, it should all mean that the information here is valid to use going forward. The Ocelot unit being top tier certainly doesn't contradict anything, that's for sure. With this naked snake with rusty CQC, being able to wipe out the entire squad with a smile, including Ocelot, the greatest among the unit. Here Snake as well showcases an uncanny ability to read an enemy's strengths and weaknesses. Being able to deduce that Ocelot's never used a revolver before, even seeing the subtleties of how he twists his elbow when firing. Later, in contrast to Ocelot, Snake says to never attempt a technique in the field unless you've mastered it 
pretty much implying that anything we see Snake do, he feels like he has a total comprehension of the skill or technique. After all these impressive displays, however, Snake is met by the boss, someone capable of lifting 660 pounds in the Davy Crockett missile system, and is soon dispatched by the boss. Now, while it's likely Snake isn't fighting or thinking at his best here, as he'd likely be in turmoil over his master's immediate betrayal, it's pretty blatant to see that the boss is superior to Snake at this point. So, after being tossed over a bridge into the water below, sustaining multiple broken bones, the boss fires an experimental super bomb with a yield greater than that of an in real life Davy Crockett. This is the first in a long line of instances where Metal Gear weapons are stated to be far more powerful than their standard, real versions. Which shows that there's no logical need to limit the series by the force of actual real-world handguns, for example, but I'll mention those other instances when we get to them. So Snake likely receives another dose of heavy radiation with no effect, and is then admitted to the most advanced hospital in the world. After a six-day stint in the infirmary, Snake is sent back into Russia to kill the boss and destroy the superweapon, the Shagohod. We're told that Snake shouldn't even be on this mission due to his remaining injuries. It's pretty consistent in interviews, and it's as well a core feature of the game itself that Naked Snake has a healing factor allowing him to recover from the insane injuries he sustains throughout his life. So it's likely that, as well as his bottomless spiritual power as Kojima says, that permits Snake to keep going. Still worth mentioning that he goes into Operation Snake Eater severely worse for wear. While it's not Wolverine level, Snake should be able to take things like blunt force, broken bones, or pierced skin, and heal much more rapidly than a regular person. He's also allowed his emotional duress to impact his skills until the boss again manhandles him, possibly meaning he had the potential to do better against her here if he was in the right state of mind. The boss also wields the Patriot rifle with one hand before her horse lands its foot on Snake's hand, making a cracking sound. Kojima noted that this should have seriously injured Snake, but this wound doesn't even register in the survival viewer as other cutscene-based wounds do. Definitely not a normal, average, everyday soldier man. But the stomp shakes Snake out of his stupor just in time to sneak around and bully the Ocelot unit again. Snake then bolos some more Gru. Bear in mind as well that the boss and the Cobra unit have actually trained the fodder since siding with the KGB as well. Kind of debunks the notion already that they are holding back on Snake. Why go as far to improve the skills of the rando goons if you're outright just going to let Snake win? Before arriving at his proper showdown with Ocelot himself, which, while this certainly isn't Ocelot at his prime, he's still an insane marksman in his own right. He's called a ricochet genius on the website, coinciding with his feet against those super elite Gru operatives, perfectly aimbotting the squad. He's also using cutting edge shooting techniques in line with the nature of CQC, again cementing the foundation of the universe's skill being at least decades beyond the real world. Snake fortunately scales to this master of shooting, either stalemating or outright beating Ocelot here. He's then stung by bees and falls down a hole into a cave, with no broken bones, mind you, dear down player. After navigating through the pitch black environment, Snake does battle with the first of the Cobras, this unit being made up of the best soldiers in the world, possessing technology even greater than Fox's own futuristic equipment, and people who had studied all forms of traditional warfare. Kojima implied in a top 5 for IGN that each of the bosses in MGS1 are stronger than the last, with the final boss being the strongest among them. This is likely true in most cases, as it makes the most sense to have the stakes raised as the story unfolds, so keep that in mind as I'm describing the likely ascending order of difficulty between these enemy units as we go along. It also makes sense considering that the Cobras are connected via radio, but still have cocky boss battle type dialogue confident they can beat Snake despite that, meaning they likely think that they could also take on the boss who Snake just defeated, since they're confident they can beat Snake himself. This is further supported by the fact that the pain is the worst shot among the Cobras, worse than a guy who just points a flamethrower at people. He is the most knowledgeable about plants and animals though, so let's go. He also has super mega bees that can make armor and manifest guns, and Snake is still able to defeat him. 
We then see Volgan put a giant hole in and shatter a concrete wall with his punches, which again will become very relevant. Around here, the player could choose to kill the end early, circumventing the boss fight. However, most guides assert that Snake does actually fight him, so Big Boss probably isn't going for the rat tactic, at least at this point in his life. Snake then sneaks into Granite's office, no problem, learns about Otacon's granddad, I mean dad, Huey, and goes on his merry way. He's then caught with his guard down by an arrow from the fear, a master of booby traps, projectile weapons, as well as an unparalleled jungle ambush artist. Probably not an anti-feat for Big Boss to get Skyrimmed at least once by the guy with those accolades. MGS3 existence actually makes this a bit better by having the fear tag Big Boss only after activating his camo and erratically jumping around, with Snake actually turning to face the arrow as it's reaching him either way, dodging all of these subsequent arrows, even dozens at a time. The Fear's Little Joe crossbow was stated to have a firing speed of 116 miles per hour. The world record for the fastest punch ever recorded was Keith Liddell at 45 miles per hour. So, even at a miserable low end, which will soon become apparent, Snake can already dodge something over two and a half times faster than the fastest strike ever thrown. The Fear is also able to seemingly defy gravity, is double jointed and has optic camouflage 40 years before it's supposed to be invented by Otacon. Despite his inhuman speed, skills and abilities, and anachronistic tech of his enemy, Snake is still able to put down the freak. On to the end, the forefather of all modern sniping techniques, someone who trained the boss into marksmanship, and is the deadliest sniper outright. He's also been fighting since the Civil War, has a shared consciousness with his forest battleground, thus boosting his awareness, and as well heals himself back to his 50s via photosynthesis. He's also stated to be faster in travel speed than the 29-year-old Naked Snake in the online story guide, which goes to show just how effective his rejuvenation ability really is. Naked Snake, with zero outdoor sniping experience, is able to track down and outsnipe the end by just a hair. Peace Walker says it took him an hour to do it, but either way, he did it. The Fury, the last living Cobra, wields the most powerful flamethrower of all time, as stated in the MGS3 Brady Games Guide. What's interesting about that is that that guide is actually written from an in-universe perspective, as if the writer is an actual inhabitant of the Metal Gear Solid world itself. Meaning that if the guide is referring to history up to the modern day of the Metal Gear universe, his flamethrower would scale above Metal Gear 1's fire troopers. Someone whose flamethrower would turn his enemies into ash according to the Metal Gear Solid 4 database. According to the Federation of British Cremation Authorities, it takes 300 kilowatt hours of energy to completely ash a human body. Converting that to joules, you get one gigajoule, and converting that, you get nearly 0.25 tons of TNT. And considering that Snake can stand within mere feet of his flamethrower's explosion with zero burns, means that Snake would likely have durability and heat resistance within those ranges, off that alone. After Snake has a Brendan Fraser mummy reference experience, he sneaks into the impenetrable fortress Groznygrad, undetected, steals Raiden's granddad's face and clothes, where he first trades blows with Volgan, flooring the giant, leaving him writhing on the floor. Per Newton's third law, Volgan would have to be as durable as the force with which he exerted to break that concrete wall, as every action has an equal and opposite reaction so Snake can slam Vulcan to the ground with more force than that. I'll get more into Vulcan scaling by the time of his actual boss fight, but I'll leave you with that for now. Snake then has a rematch with the boss. He undoubtedly does much better this time in this fight. We pretty much know for a fact that Big Boss is getting better over the course of MGS3, retraining himself through combat, defeating stronger and stronger enemies, and so on. So it stands to reason that he's doing much better here, keeping up with the boss's speed, disarming her of her blade, withstanding her strikes, and escaping one of her holds, before being ultimately bested yet again. The boss then gets problematic in Floor's Vulgan. Funnily enough, Vulgan's on the ground longer after Snake's throw than the boss's, so make of that what you will. Snake, weary and beaten by the boss, is then pummeled and tortured by Vulgan. Keep in mind everything Snake's been through up to this point, 
broken bones, the ICU, the cobras, and now he's being brutalized by a sadist who can channel 10 million volts of electricity. He also channels that power into his physical strikes. In fact, pretty much every piece of supplemental media states Vulcan strictly attacks foes with 10 million volts specifically. And yet, Snake can toss Vulcan hard enough to hurt him, something his own electric-empowered strikes failed to do, as well as hold up to numerous of those attacks from Vulcan. The dude doesn't even black out after being blasted multiple times by this lightning, and then shot in the eyeball and leg. Some people argue that Vulcan wasn't necessarily using his full power against Snake. However, he literally says 10 million volts before hitting him with the old Palpatine. He's also been stated by Kojima to get literally high and careless while torturing people, literally killing Granin before he could get any useful information out of him. Not to mention, Vulcan's particularly angry at Snake in response to him hurting his lover. Furthermore, Snake's both bruised and drenched in water before the shock torture, with the National Institutes for Occupational Safety and Health stating that one's resistance to electricity is reduced by up to 10,000 times as it would be under normal conditions. With all that said, this particularly fatigued naked snake would scale to 10 million volts of electricity. Converting volts to tons of TNT, we get around 24 tons of TNT or enough force to annihilate a city block. Now we're getting to the good stuff, and I'm sure a lot of people have their doubts by now, but let me make my case. I believe that even before all of this, it's been thoroughly shown that both of these characters as well as their weapons are demonstrably far above real humans or real guns, flamethrowers, and so on. If there is a preponderance of evidence, and it only becomes greater from this point forward, saying that these characters are not bound by real world limitations, as all fiction is not, then I can logically say that a feat like this is in no way out of line with the insane things we've already seen them do. If these characters are stated to have futuristic advanced weapons that output far more force than any gun in the real world, then I am in no way logically bound to say that any weapon we see potentially damage our hero is 100% as weak as a real gun by comparison, especially not when compared with the rest of the franchise. If you can accept that, great. If not, keep watching and things should get clearer as we go along. After this, Snake backhands the goat Johnny, outran dogs and other soldiers with a bullet wound in his leg, and falls from an extreme height into water below. Nothing of note really happens scaling-wise, Snake takes a stroll either in the afterlife, a place between life and death, or a waking dream besides the sorrow. He's pretty cool though, he can talk to the dead and take their battle information as well as their skills, or he could before, uh, you know. Snake adapts to fighting with one eye, sneaks back into Grozny Grad with zero difficulty, fights the boss again, forcing her on the back foot and counters another joint lock, before being tossed yet again. He is however far better off this time than he was after the fight prior, as he was pretty much defenseless against Vulcan after the boss had beaten him that time. He's back on his feet much sooner here. He then does proper combat against Vulcan. The game itself implies Snake just throws hands with Vulcan, but existence shows us he does use guns against him. The piggyback guide says Snake used Vulcan's weakness against him. The player can use water pipes above Vulcan like it's a Pokemon battle, so maybe that has happened here as well. It also shows that Snake actually got hit a fair few times, especially in forcing Snake's scaling to full power Vulcan, as this isn't a torture session but an all-out fight. Vulcan was stated to be a boxing champion in the game's voice casting sheet. I haven't been able to find any other sources that says this, and some things in the casting sheet were changed, like Big Boss's Arnold-type appearance, so do with that what you will. Regardless, Snake is able to blitz Vulcan and his lightning bolt attacks. Vulcan's just looking right at him, fires lightning, and then Snake is out of sight and behind Vulcan. The average speed of lightning based on academic papers is around 1300 times the speed of sound, or nearly 1 million miles per hour, meaning that Snake can dodge objects moving at that speed. Keep in mind this is combat and reaction speed, not travel speed. He's not the road runner, he's more like Muhammad Ali on Mega Ultra Super Crack. The guidebook for MGS3 as well says these are lightning bolts outright, so it is valid to use the speed of lightning here, or over two times faster than the real world's fastest rocket, the Parker Solar Probe. As we can all observe, Snake's rounds are able to hurt Vulcan more than the amount of energy that his own concrete-busting punches can output. 
Another example of the guns in Metal Gear being far more powerful than they are in real life, there's no handgun making elbow deep craters in a stone wall. And Snake physically scales to Volgan, making him desperate enough to ask Ocelot for help. Ocelot declines and is able to intercept Volgan's lightning with his own handgun rounds. Let me reiterate, super tech future guns, flamethrowers that can turn people to ash, experimental mega nukes, guns with infinite ammo. It is plenty consistent for these bullets to be as fast as lightning bolts in this fictional universe where there is magic nanomachine ghosts and people who can read minds. Not to mention that in the sequence, with giant chunks of steel beams and concrete falling overhead, Snake is able to vaporize the massive amounts of rock and metal with a single RPG blast. No real RPG could do this. Turn all of this into dust? And this is necessary for the plot, for Snake to reduce this rubble to the point that it's harmless to Ocelot. These aren't real guns, people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Moving on, multiple sets of C3, a helicopter exploding over top it, slamming into a plane, all do nothing to the Shagohod. Despite that, Snake damages the thing with two RPG shots to the back, with Volgan then being able to punch a hole in its roof. So Snake's face doesn't cave in after multiple punches by the same Volgan, yet the Shagohod, some doomsday weapon that no-sells all of this, is like cardboard compared to Volgan. Snake then floors him after a single rocket attack from his evidently supercharged RPG. We see too that Volgan just straight up has a bullet hole breaking the skin of his forehead, and he's still trucking along just fine. Some crazy pain tolerance and endurance that Naked Snake would scale to via his direct feats against Volgan. Mr. Thunderbolt is then struck by lightning, has his own ammo blow up on top of him, lights on fire, and is still too mad to die. Just no selling all of these bullets if the Kojima overseen existence is to be taken at face value. Now, Snake finally arrives at the site of the final boss, and I just want to lay out all of his experiences up until now. Snake Eater starts on August 30th and ends on September 2nd. That's more or less four days of non-stop grueling action. Getting shot, tortured, electrocuted, fighting a gauntlet of the best soldiers of all time up to that point. Sure, Snake has a healing factor, but you can't say that his performance isn't at all hindered by even just the mental strain of everything he's been through. Now he has to fight the boss, the greatest soldier of all time at that time. Someone with all of the end's marksmanship skills. Someone who the Calitech genius AI developer Strangelove considered to be boundless in knowledge and wisdom. Someone with inestimable combat and weapon knowledge honed to superhuman levels of perfection and a master of CQC. With statements like boundless combat knowledge, near infinite variations, it is reasonable to say that these aren't literally the case and are more so hyperbolic. It's probably being used in the same manner and way as the phrase off the charts, practically meaning that the boss should be a master of all martial arts or have skill comparable to such. That is honestly the more conservative interpretation and makes sense given her prestige as is. The art book for Metal Gear Solid's 1 through 4 also states her to be a master of Qigong. While things like this often represent a work in progress, her skills shown in the game itself do represent those techniques. Qi Gong is pretty much the foundation for concepts like Ki in Dragon Ball or Chakra in Naruto, and could stand as another way to justify the superhuman nature of the game's cast. As far as you and I are concerned, this is just make-believe, but the staff of Metal Gear treat the martial art as valid within the fictional universe itself. China Man was a cut boss from MGS2 that was also a user of secret Qi Gong techniques, who still made his way into the canon via Metal Gear Solid 2's cutscenes, so it's not just a one-off incident. What actual proponents of Qigong claim is that the technique provides healing, durability increase, and enhanced spatial awareness through harnessing one's own inner energy. Like that guy, we also burn that paper with just his hands. It's also got more craziness like attacking Qi pathways or pressure points, death touch, and gravity manipulation. The art book asserts that the boss doesn't need anything like heavy armor since she can simply enhance her physicality through Qi 
and can even choose to leave no footprints through the same means. Think back to how little the bridge is swayed under the boss's footsteps, for example. Take it or leave it mostly, I'm simply offering this as a fairly official explanation for these greater than peak human displays in the series. Again, remember, Snake's gone through an entire game's worth of trials and tribulations, as opposed to the boss who hasn't really strained herself at all up to this point. Snake does note that she looks tired in the novel, implying her age has placed her past her prime. However, she's still described as the best soldier ever in her current state. So unless the boss game Kojima wanted to make ever comes out, and she does some absolutely bonkers stuff in it, it doesn't really mean much. We have nothing to compare what a tired boss looks like compared to a in her quote unquote prime boss, if that's even what it really means. She could just be kind of sullen about the scenario she's been put in. Both fighters are as well wearing sneaking suits stated to suppress footsteps and provide damage resistance. Snake has his final fight with his mentor, wherein he counters her CQC, avoids her gunfire, all while the boss makes note of his improved strength and skill, ultimately defeating the once greatest warrior of all time. Now, I've tackled the notion that the boss was holding back against Big Boss before, but again, the MGS3 Piggyback Guide, Piggyback being lauded as super accurate and genuine by Kojima Productions themselves, being written with exclusive information given by Kojima Productions, states that the boss fought with no quarter asked or given. This is a military idiom. I'm sure it's one recognizable to any current or former members listening now. Looking into the phrase's definition myself, as well as asking friends and family of my own participating in active duty, this essentially means that both parties were asking for no pity when facing the other. Now, of course, the boss knew that she had to die at Snake's hands. That is undeniable. However, she still fights Snake, shooting at him, trying to stab him. He could have been killed at many points, but even Snake isn't sure that he wants to kill the boss. When he hears her voice 10 years later, he breaks out in a cold sweat. It, it wasn't an easy thing to bring himself to fight her. Even if I grant that she was holding back in a sense that she knew she couldn't kill Big Boss, you can still give your all in a fight without the intent to kill. UFC fighters are hitting as hard as they can, using all of their talents to win. They aren't trying to rip anyone's head off, but they're still going all out. On top of that, Snake's been fighting for three days straight, on a mission that he was officially medically suggested to not go in in the first place. So even if the boss is holding back and that somewhat hinders her, Snake himself would be hindered both by his own hesitation as well as his heavy fatigue by this point in comparison to the boss. And I don't want to get so deep into character motivations and so on, but are we really going to say that during her speech where she's literally crying and begging for Snake to give her the fight of her life, is she lying? Yeah, I get that she's withholding the truth for the sake of the mission, but is she even as amicable at that point? She's a sociopath by that of anything. Regardless of any of that, official sources verified by the game's developers say she was going all out. The script says Snake won a fierce battle against her. The Konami website says they fought savagely or angrily against one another. Kojima just says point blank that Snake defeated her. The novel says she was going all out. Nothing says she was holding back or that she let Snake beat her. There's a logical interpretation that allows all of this to work together. Naked Snake beats the boss fair and square. He also canonically sees her ghost and sorrow ascend to heaven, giving some legitimacy to all those prior sightings of the sorrow and making Peace Walker a lot dumber than it already is. He then battles Ocelot, who shows us just what he's made of. Because he's the son of the boss, he has a giant pool of potential. He actually perfected his own form of CQC through watching and experiencing a Naked Snake's version of it firsthand and gives Snake a pretty good fight. However, the boss does an old Ben and reminds Snake to trust in the Force, where he proves the better of the gunslinger. Again, someone who can adapt and perfect techniques based on sight alone is still lesser than that of Big Boss. To lay out Big Boss's stats so far based on feats shown in Metal Gear Solid 3 alone, he has city block level attack power and durability, reflexes at the speed of lightning, elite level stealth abilities leaving no trace, and various analytical skills and martial arts slash marksman prowess greater than those with mastery over every fighting style 
50 years more advanced than those in the era. And that's the scaling for Metal Gear Solid 3. Snake surpasses the boss and becomes Big Boss. Stay tuned for part two of the series where I will tackle a much more controversial entry into the Metal Gear franchise. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.